Hi everyone and welcome to this week's video. This is the 1st of February today and that's getting exciting because that means that very soon I am going to be able to start doing my first seed sowing of 2023 season. So I can't wait for that. So this is going to be the last week that I am going to be looking back at 2022 to see what I can learn from last year that I can then move forwards with into this new growing season. And every year throws up different things. So um, as a flower grower and a gardener, you're constantly learning every year something new to take forwards. And in this video today, we're gonna look at a few different things that have definitely cropped up for me. And I am gonna really use that information and see if it helps me. Obviously, we don't know what we're gonna get this year. I think that the weather conditions are what is really changing over the years now as a flower grower. We're getting more extreme weather coming in and it's learning how to grow these differing conditions and adapting to that. So I'm taking little bits from last year and I'm going to add that into my growing plans for this one. So I hope you enjoy it and I hope it gives you some ideas for yourself as well. So early on in the season last year I learned a lot more about harvesting at the correct stage for the clients that you're providing flowers for. So for instance tulips, I've always thought they're very pretty when they're full of colour and you can cut them then and that provides really nice flowers for bouquets and arrangements and wedding flowers. But actually, if you're providing for florists, they might not want them fully out at that stage. They might want them in tighter bud so that they will come out later in the week for them. However, if they were doing wedding flowers um, and it was going to be two days later that the wedding was going to take place and they were picking them up from you 48 hours before, then you would want them to be fairly out. So you have to judge who it is that you're providing your flowers for and at what stage you should be harvesting them. And with tulips, it was quite difficult last year because we had a very cold late spring. None of the tulips came out early April and then suddenly the end of April, beginning of May, they all came out. So you're picking four or five times a day just to make sure you're getting them at the right stage. So if I wanted to use tulips later in the week or I wanted to provide them for florists who are going to pick up on a Tuesday but not want to use them until towards the weekend then you're wanting to pick them when they're in bud with just a bit of colour on them and at that stage you can pull up the entire tulip bulb and all and you can lay them in trays and put them into a nice dry cold storage area. When you're ready to use them you can then chop the bulb off the stem and then put them into water to rehydrate them and then they're absolutely fine. I also started to use a fridge um, for cooling which worked brilliantly with the tulips and my old stone garage was the perfect place to keep the tulips once you've harvested them to keep them as fresh as possible for when they're needed. So the tulips that you can see here in the flower patch, they are starting to get a bit of colour on them. The ones that are a bit further back are probably perfect harvest. The ones here are not far away. That even in a day will come on enough that you would um, want to pick them if you are wanting to store them for use later in the week. Again here you can see that the ones closest to us, they have got some colour in the buds and they would be fine for picking for use later in the week. The tulips in these pictures from the flower patch show that they're really fully out so they're best to be enjoyed that day and you wouldn't sell them on. The ones here are just coming out, they're not quite so bad but again you'd be wanting to use them within the next one to two days to enjoy them at their best. And these Attila ones as well, they've fully started to come out there so again use in one to two days but not for later in the week. Wrapping your tulips can be really helpful in keeping the stems upright and nice and sturdy because tulips tend to grow and stretch once you've harvested them. So just wrapping them in newspaper or brown paper will really help with that. These ones were cut for use um, which was to be enjoyed within the next day or two. So they are more fully out than if I had just cut them when they were in bud with a bit of colour. So here's another example, you can see the honeymoon white fringe tulips behind the parrot ones there and you can see that they're just starting to get a bit of white colour on the top, you can see the fringes there. So within that day or the day after you'll be able to pull them, harvest bulb and all for storage for later use with those tulips. 
but if you needed to harvest some for say wedding work where you're going to want them to look at their best and fully open in the next day or two then you'd want to leave them to a later stage like these ones here which are fully out and will look beautiful if you were to use them in a bouquet that was to be enjoyed that day or for a bridal bouquet that was to be used within the next 24 or 48 hours. Sunflowers was another one that I was learning about harvesting last year. So they look amazing when they're at a stage when they're fully out like this. They're absolutely beautiful. And a customer may want a ready bunch of sunflowers that are fully out like this to give to someone so that they can enjoy them. And they won't get as long a vase life out of them, but they'll be looking really pretty when they hand them over to who they want to give them to. However, if you're cutting for florists who want to use them later in the week, then you might want to cut them more at this stage when the petals are just starting to unfurl and they will continue to open for you after they have been harvested. And that will give a much longer vase life for them. However, again, if you are cutting for wedding flowers, a florist may want to use them within 48 hours of collection for that, and you would want them more fully out at that stage for them. What I learned to do in 2022 was to cut deeper into the plant when I harvested my dahlia stems. And this is something in previous years I've been really tentative about doing. I thought that if you cut deep into the stems, then you're going to reduce the plant size and it's not going to come again well for you over the season or it would take so long to come back again that you wouldn't get more um, stems of flowers. But in actual fact, what I learned this year by being a little bit more confident about doing it and cutting deeper into the plant when I was harvesting my stems was that I was getting longer stems in the future with great flowers on them. By being too tentative in years gone by, I was getting much shorter secondary stems and smaller flowers. So that's a good lesson I've learned this year is to be more confident, still cut above a leaf node so that you get more um, shoots coming, but cut deep into the plant to encourage longer stems. It won't give you shorter ones, it will give you longer ones. And the other thing about dahlias is making sure that you harvest at the right time. So it can be very easy to think that they'll continue to open once you harvest them like sunflowers, but actually that's not true. Dahlia flowers will not continue to open once you harvest. So you have to make sure they're at quite a mature stage by the time you cut. For example, this dahlia has started to unfurl its petals and if it was like a sunflower, you could cut it at this stage and it would continue to open. But this dahlia will not if you cut it now. It would only stay looking like this, so you need to wait longer. This particular dahlia here is still got a lot of petals still to unfurl and these will not come out if you cut at this stage. So this one, again, is too immature to cut from. What you're looking for is to cut at this stage when all the petals are out but you have to check the back and make sure that they're not starting to wilt at the back. If they're starting to wilt at the back, you've left it too long. So just check when you're looking at your dahlias for harvesting and um, check the back as well as the front to make sure that it's all looking good. So I'm still learning about zinnias. Last year I started off my zinnia seeds in May because we'd had such a cold spring and I knew they didn't tolerate really cold weather so I thought I'll just hold off and I'll sow them in May, get them planted out and then they'll produce great flowers for me towards the end of the summer. That didn't work and um, they did germinate really well but then we did have a period of really dry weather um, with winds and I don't think that that helped the zinnias to get established either. And in the end, the zinnias started to flower for me at the very end of September and into October. And that might be okay in some growing zones where your first frosts aren't until later in the season. But for me, things are always slowing down by that stage. And luckily last year, we didn't end up having a frost until November. But the large majority of my flowers were tailing off. And then you haven't got anything for these zinnias to go with. So ideally, I would want them to flower earlier on. And I think that means that this year, I'm going to start them off in late March, early April, and then get them planted out earlier in the garden. And hopefully we won't have such cold spring this year that um, prevents me from planting them out. But if I have to grow them on in the greenhouse for a bit longer um, to keep them warmer or put them under a caterpillar tunnel in the garden to bring them on, then that would be fine as well. 
Another lesson that I learned last year was the value of having this horizontal netting and the stakes and cane supporting the plants and getting this in a really early stage before you've got the flowers really growing tall and coming out because it's much more difficult to put netting on then. But the reason that it has become far more valuable to me is because I'm finding that the weather conditions are getting far more windy. We're getting a lot of unexpected gales overnight and it can come at any time of the year it's not necessarily just going to be in the autumn winter time we can have them early on in the spring we can have them in May for example so um, this was the end of May these flowers here that I've just harvested for a wedding and I had had to pick them when there was gale force winds and if I had not had the staking in place and the support netting none of these flowers would have been able to be used because they would have been flopped over and crushed so really really important lesson from last year is make sure it's in early because you don't know when these unexpected gale force winds are going to come and make sure that everything is adequately supported. Don't leave anything to chance. So one of the big lessons that I learned last year was if something's not working, it's not efficient, then you can do things to change it. And then your flower growing, your flower farming will be so much the better for it. So I've had this third flower patch in my garden for the last few years and I thought it was going to be a great extra space for growing. But things didn't quite work out. So I started off with these nice rows. I'd managed to put pass and rows in on the right hand side and then I had my narcissi growing in grass on the left hand side and that was okay um, and then I got the idea that I wanted to plant more narcissi so I put that in between um, in the grass paths and I ended up with a huge area with lots of narcissi but it wasn't functional. I wasn't able to access the narcissi because I didn't have the paths anymore so you're going to end up trampling on daffodils when you're going in to cut them. I then thought that I'd be left with this great space once the narcissi had died back for late summer flowers but actually it didn't work at all because I had no paths so anything that you're growing you're going to have to walk into the middle of the beds to harvest and that's not ideal. Ideally you want to have these long thin flower beds in rows where you can have paths in between so that you can access the flowers from all sides and you can lean in right over to the edge of the bed to harvest you're not actually walking into a flower bed to cut your flowers. Yes, this patch of ground gives you lots of space to grow lots of flowers, but it's not user friendly. I can't access it properly without trampling on the soil, which is what you're trying not to do at all times. You don't want to ruin that soil structure by stamping on it. You don't want to be walking on top of flowers either accidentally. So I could have left it like this. And yes, I would have had my narcissi growing in the spring every year and they'd be protected from the rabbits. But at the same time, I wouldn't be able to use it at any other time of year as a productive flower patch. So I decided that I would need to change it. The risk with changing it is that these narcissi are no longer going to be protected by a fence. They are going to be outside in the lawn where they are open to the rabbits. Now, in theory, rabbits shouldn't be interested in narcissi. They shouldn't normally go near it. But I have thought that they had been doing this previously, which is why I did fence the area initially. But actually, I think slugs are probably just as much of a problem on the narcissi as the rabbits are. And because I have so many narcissi now, I'm hoping that, OK, the rabbits can have some, but they should leave the majority untouched. But we'll have to wait and see whether that does happen this spring. It'll certainly be interesting to see. I'm hoping that the benefit of having a third flower patch that now functions all year round for me and that I can access from all sides and I can grow my flowers far more efficiently there is going to outweigh any negatives of moving the narcissi into an open area. So the first job was to get all the narcissi dug up out of the flower patch on the left hand side here and transplant it into the grass. And I'm hoping that I've got the vast majority of the narcissi up. And it should maybe take another couple of years for them to settle down in the grass and produce a really good display of flowers. But they will naturalise there and more and more flowers will appear over the years. And I think that will also make the garden look really pretty in the springtime, as well as providing me with flowers to harvest. The next job was to measure everything out and start creating the paths and the flower beds. And I've got about three quarters of this done. I've got a little bit more paths to add in in the top section before it's finished for the spring. 
And what I'm doing here is I've used a lot of the builder's plastic that they left over from our house extension to cover the beds and that'll just help to get rid of any weeds. It's been on for the whole of the winter months so far so I will remove it in the springtime and then the beds will get mulched with compost before they're ready to use. The ones on the right hand side were created through no dig methods and I'll use the same idea with these where I just continuously add more compost to the soil rather than digging down to try and stop the weeds. By providing these new two rows of flower beds that I will have that will just give me the extra space that I needed for being able to plant out the full number of annuals that I grow and to be able to rotate beds around more successfully as well. I won't feel like I'm trying to cram in seedlings into every available space. Um, I'm going to have a more ordered way of planting things out now which I think will be much better. At the moment, because it's winter time, it's difficult to envisage this as a working flower patch. But as the months go on and we start to use it, I'll be able to show you how it's working. And hopefully it'll do really well for me with lots of dahlias and summer annuals growing in here. So I would say definitely have a look at things. If things aren't working for you in your flower farm or your garden, you can change things. Things don't have to stay the way they are. Another change that I made this year as well is starting to transplant a stilby because I had it in a very dry raised bed that wasn't getting very much irrigation and a stilby, like damper soil, they like to have moisture and um, so I wasn't getting the best from my plants there so I dug a lot of these up and transplanted them into the top flower patch in the autumn and I'm hoping that because they're now in a much more moist bed then they're going to adapt well and do much better for me there. So again if you've got things growing in conditions that aren't ideal for that plant, then you can change things as you go along. So last year's weather was quite challenging. So we had a very late spring because of the winter weather just continued on. It was very, very cold up until the end of April. Then we had a sudden rush of all the spring flowers all coming out at once over a shorter period of weeks. We then went into June time where we started to have very dry spell of weather, not much rain for Scotland and also there was a lot of wind, so a lot of drying winds. And this was around the time that a lot of things are getting newly established in the garden for me. So they'd gone out later this year, got planted out later because of that extra cold spring that we'd had and then when they did go out the weather was very very dry and it was windy as well which didn't suit the plants. So what I'm thinking is that they needed more irrigation at that time of year. I probably didn't water them as much as I should have done because the prolonged dry weather went on and on and I think I was probably expecting the rain to come and for us to go back to our usual damp Scottish summer. So the plants really stalled, they didn't grow like they usually would and normally I have cosmos that looks like this. I love cosmos, they grow into really beautiful bushy big sturdy plants if you pinch them out and they produce flowers month after month throughout the summer and then into the autumn until the first frost. But they were really struggling this year, they didn't grow tall, they didn't establish, I had much much fewer flowers than I usually would and it wasn't just the cosmos that was affected by this, my annual asters, they were very short stemmed and didn't grow very well, my scabious which is usually very abundant with many many flowers for a good few months, it also didn't grow very well and I am putting this down to that dry period of weather with a lot of wind that they didn't like. So what I'm going to take home from this is that I'm going to have to make sure that when you first plant out your seedlings into the garden in early summer time that you do water them in and establish them well with good irrigation and just keep an eye on what's happening with the weather. If it is very dry the watering is going to need to be increased. I can't rely anymore on the Scottish weather assuming that we're going to have plenty of rainfall like we have had previously. I think we are going to have more spells where it is a lot drier and therefore I'm going to have to irrigate more. So a few years ago I started using organza bags on some of my problem dahlias to keep out the earwigs like you can see here and also to help with preventing thrip damage and it worked fairly well but I didn't use them on all that many dahlias, just some of them. 
Last year I decided that I would really use them a lot more and I would put them on much earlier. I would get them on the buds of a lot of my dahlias and see if it worked and it really did. I managed to get perfect dahlia stems with not nearly as much thrip damage, slug damage and they were perfectly formed with beautiful petals. What I learned last year as well was that you don't just need to use organza bags on dahlias, they can actually work on other flowers as well and I started experimenting using them on sunflowers and chrysanthemums which were sometimes petal damaged by insects as well for me and it worked really really well so I'm going to take that away for 2023 and I'm going to keep using the organza bags. Um, it's a bit time consuming to put them on but they do the job perfectly and it is well worth that extra few minutes of popping them on the buds when they're first starting to form to have the peace of mind that you're going to have perfect flowers that are not going to be insect damaged and they're roomy enough that the flowers can develop really well inside without the petals getting crushed. So at the end of 2022 we were given some surprising weather. Usually we have temperatures around just above freezing or just below over the winter time and very occasionally we get a harsher winter but this is usually after Christmas in the months of February, March time. But in December this year we were suffering for a long period of minus 15 overnight and down to minus 8 in the daytime and this was really really unheard of. Um, it's probably the coldest it's been in the whole time that I have been growing flowers and it really had a huge effect on what I had grown especially those autumn hardy annuals so what I found was that the things that I had planted in the ground so the anemones and the ranunculus and the hardy annuals that I had planted outside they survived, they came through that period of cold, mainly maybe because they were insulated by the snow cover um, and they were protected a little bit more. But everything in the greenhouse really suffered and I lost the vast majority of all my autumn seedlings and ranunculus, I would say about 75% I lost in there. And that showed me that when the temperature really goes to the extremes of very, very cold, then the greenhouse temperature really dips down much, much lower than I thought it would and everything in pots is that much more vulnerable to the cold. If it's in the soil I think it's that bit more protected outside. What I now need to work out is was this a one-off? Were those really really low temperatures just a one-off occurrence that won't happen again for many years? Or is this part of climate change that we are seeing more extremes? We're seeing windier weather, we're seeing drier spells than we were used to in the summertime, we're seeing more extremes of cold in the winter time. Am I going to have to adapt and change how I grow? And last year at this stage I would have had a huge amount in the greenhouse all looking really really good and healthy because the weather over the winter had been mild and in that case it was really worthwhile growing like that. So we've got two different scenarios here. We've got the majority of years where I have sown hardy annuals in the autumn, like in 2021. They've then got through a mild winter and gone on to produce really great early flowers for me the following spring. Then we've got a harsh winter where we have lost the majority of our autumn sown seedlings already and having to start again from scratch in February re-sowing them. One of the things that you could be thinking is why bother to sow seeds in the autumn and overwinter plants at all if it's going to cause this many problems and you're going to lose so many due to the weather conditions. Maybe it's better just waiting until February to restart your seed sowing then. I would say that the difference in the flowers last year was so big I really did find that the ones that were autumn sown and that I got through the winter in 2022 were fantastic they were huge the difference in the Ami Magis was amazing really really tall plants that were getting up towards six foot tall and huge flowers on them the same with the cornflowers and the Gypsophil Convert Garden they were all fantastic and when I sowed in the winter time then I just wasn't getting the same flowers and size of stems um, off of them. They were perfectly adequate plants but the difference was absolutely amazing. I think it was the first year that I really noticed what a difference autumn sowing can make. So I would still say definitely worth sowing these cool flowers in the autumn but how we overwinter them that's what needs to be looked at. 
So what I'm going to do this year is I am going to look at flowering times. I'm going to look at when these hardy annuals that have been in the ground all winter this year, when are they flowering? And I'm also going to look at the survivors in the greenhouse. They'll get planted out in March and I'm going to see when they flower as well. And if there's not much difference between the two, then maybe it is just worth planting more of my stock outside into the beds directly in the autumn rather than keeping them in the greenhouse. So I'll keep you updated on that as the year goes on and we'll have a look and see what we think would be the best thing to do for overwintering our hardy annuals come next autumn. I mean one thing's for sure is that they're definitely worth sowing and um, I certainly am not going to stop that but I just need to work out the best way forwards from now on. I think this is probably the most important lesson that I have learned and it's about looking after yourself and I think 2022 was probably the first year where I truly did try a bit harder with this. So I've been flower farming now since 2015 and when I started out I was 35 um, and I'm now 43 and I really have found that I would go through a lot of the flower season and keep going keep going I'm the only person that's running the business and then by the time you were getting to early autumn September time quite often I was burning out so I would come down with all sorts of things and I would just be feeling physically at the end and you've still got another couple of months to go um, at that stage you've still got flowers and then you've got all the bulb planting and then Christmas and things and I was finding that because you're self-employed and your business is right there, it's right in front of you in the garden, you're working seven days a week, you're not putting it down, I'm doing things in the evening, I'm doing things at weekends, there's no let up and it really wasn't good for me, it wasn't good for me physically and it wasn't good for my mental well-being either. So last year I made a big conscience effort to change things. I started to say no to different things so I wouldn't take on everything that came my way if I thought that it was too much. And um, For example, before I would have done more than one wedding in a weekend, now I wouldn't, I would just stick to the one. I also made the decision that I would no longer be doing weddings and um, I was going to take a break from that and I was going to change the business slightly and as much as I loved them it did take up weekends it was highly stressful to get the flowers blooming at a precise time so that was a change that I thought that might help me and instead I would provide them for the florists who could then arrange them for weddings um, but a lot of things that were important were just simple things like sitting down and having a cup of tea. If you've done a lot of physical work in a morning, then take a break. You don't need to keep going and keep going until you know it's the end of the school day and the kids are going to come home. Don't try and pack so much in into that time that it's too much. Take regular breaks. Um, I had some physio last year which helped me because I was finding that I was starting to get lower back pain and pain also in my legs and that really did help. Um, doing some yoga, I went back to make sure that I was playing tennis and swimming which are things that I love to do. I made sure that I had holidays booked so it's very difficult as a flower farmer to justify time off in the flower season to go away on holiday but it's really really important and so I made sure that we went away as a family, we had that precious time together, we went camping at weekends with friends, we went wild swimming and we used the kayak and um, enjoyed picnics and things like that. So if you're flower farming I definitely recommend getting a few holidays booked in for 2023. We already have some booked out as well already and the flower farm yes it's maybe not what you want it to be when you come back from um, your holiday but it doesn't take long to tidy it back up, give everything a good water and a good deadhead. Before you know it things are back under control again and you feel so much more refreshed for having been away. You don't have to go away on holiday to enjoy a break, just leave the flower patch behind, get out and have a good walk outside in your local countryside or area and it's great for just giving you a different perspective, clearing your head and just giving you a bit of a break and loosening off those muscles in a different way. 
just changing a few things um, to help me out last year made such a big difference and I think it was the first year that I really did feel like I hadn't burnt out by the end of the season I'd kept well I was feeling good and I still had lots of energy for all that bulb planting and lots of enthusiasm felt like I was starting to find a better balance and I'm definitely not there yet I still know that there's definitely still things that I need to work on but I am getting better at it and that definitely puts me in a better place to enjoy what I'm doing enjoy the flowers enjoy the garden and spend good amounts of quality time with my family have some downtime and keep myself physically and mentally well so that's definitely my biggest recommendation from today's lessons learned video is to take time for yourself look after yourself if you're running a business like me where you're the only person doing it then you have to make sure that you're looking after your physical and mental well-being and that helps to get you through the growing season and keeps you fresh and full of enthusiasm for what you're doing so thanks so much for watching today's video. I hope you found it helpful just having a look at some of the things that I learned from last year. And I know that I'm definitely gonna be doing things like getting my support netting in early. I know just from just now in the last 48 hours, we've had a lot of wind again, and I know it's gonna be like that through the coming growing season. So just having supports in place means that those flowers are gonna be protected. So definitely advise that if you don't do it already, put some kind of system in to support your cut flowers and also just um, other things like making sure that I keep harvesting at the right stage thinking about who I am now going to be growing flowers for so before it was a lot of weddings and I needed my flowers to be fully out whereas now we're moving away from this we're now starting to supply flowers for florists and things and it's thinking at the stage that those flowers are going to have to be for the florist so what's the florist using my flowers for that week and then other things like those zinnias, we'll have a shot at them again this year, but I'm certainly going to start growing them earlier and get them planted out earlier just to give them more of a chance. I think that they can probably tolerate a little bit more cold outside than I thought that they could. So I think they can probably go out earlier just so that they can get growing and then produce flowers in the summer rather than at the autumn time for me. And then that big thing, looking after yourself as well. That is definitely something that I recommend. It's really, really important. Gardening is a great thing to do. Um, it makes you feel really good being outside in the fresh air with the wildlife and weeding the beds and seeing the flowers working with them. But if you're not careful and you're running a business, then it can get on top of you. And there's always so much to do that just take time for yourselves, have that cup of tea, sit down, book yourself a holiday um, and that'll help you with your 2023 growing season. So February is going to be an exciting time. We're going to get started with the seed sowing, which I'll show you in the next few weeks. So I'm going to start off with sweet peas and hardy annuals and get them growing. They'll then get planted out at the end of March, beginning of April um, for some early summer flowers. And we're going to also be keeping on top of the garden outside. So it's continuing with the weeding. It's cutting those hellebore leaves back so that we can let the new buds come up. It's going to be finishing off that third flower patch so that it's more efficient and that I have got the paths finished and the new beds ready there. I'm starting to run out of my own compost, so I'm going to probably have to order some in locally just to mulch and finish those beds off. And I'm also trying to work at the moment on trying to find a peat-free compost that I like using. I'm finding this one a little bit difficult with the textures and things and just getting things to grow well in peat-free compost at the moment. But it's so important from an environmental point of view that we try and move over to peat-free compost. So um, I'm trying a new one out at the moment and we'll see how we get on with that. So join me in February for lots more time in the garden and greenhouse and getting growing for 2023.